Mark uh, did his undergraduate work at Harvard and uh, master's at Cambridge in physics and mathematics before uh, moving to Princeton um, in his PhD with, again, uh, one of our own, Steve Block. Um, he has a joint investigator position with uh, the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. And, um, and well, as a postdoc, uh, he was at Bell Labs, and, uh, I think. Uh, uh, you know, several of us in this, uh, several of you in the audience have also um, been all lives. So, you know, Mark is one of these people who uh, it really is true when, when someone announces that there are too many awards to actually mention, like that's definitely the case, we would be here too long. So let me just pick out the, the, the absolute highlights. Um, of course, the Howard Hughes Medical Institute Investigator Award, um, the Keck Medical Program Grant, and Paul Allen grants uh, from the last few years, as well as uh, NIH Director's Pioneer Award, Packard Fellowship, and PKs are highlights. So um, with that, I'm going to hand it over to you, Mark, and uh, really excited to hear about uh, your work. All right, thanks so much, Ben. Are the mics all good back there? Okay, great. Um, so I'm gonna tell you about uh, some recent work that we've been doing here at Stanford using optical imaging techniques to image uh, neural coding and computation dynamics in the mammalian neocortex. Um, and for those of you that are not familiar with our lab's approach, this slide summarizes um, our basic strategy. Our, our focus in the lab is to try to understand neural, neural information processing. Our general approach is to try to develop new technologies, generally optical tools that will uh, facilitate us or help us in our quest to understand neural computation, the new tools generally develop, they generally give us the opportunity to gather some unique data sets. Uh, these data sets are some of the largest in our field, tens of terabytes or more. Um, we have some analysis challenges, which I'll describe today. And overall, we are usually able to identify some novel biological mechanisms by, com by combining these different um, methodologies. So you might ask, well, why, why take an optical imaging approach if you're interested in the brain? And at some level, I think Marcel Proust said it best. Um, this, this quotation, you know, it gives us the sense that we might be looking at a familiar object, in our case, the mammalian brain, but we can do it in new ways by developing new imaging techniques. And as I'll show you, we can get some new glimpses of what's going on um, in the mammalian neocortex this way. So the question that I'm gonna focus on today is what limits the accuracy with which a large population of neurons can encode a sensory scene. So what, what limits the fidelity of our visual system in particular? And I'm largely gonna be focusing on two recent papers that were spearheaded by two recent uh, PhD students, Oleg Ramyansov and uh, Nsada Ibrahimi. And uh, these two papers were also close collaborations with our colleague in applied physics, uh, Suri Ganguly. So that line of my talk today is as follows. So first I'm gonna introduce the question. I'm gonna discuss what are the factors that might found the, fide the fidelity of sensory neural coding. And I'll tell you about some longstanding ideas regarding correlated neural noise, correlated fluctuations in pairs or greater ensembles of cells that uh, have been hypothesized to limit the fidelity of coding in the mammalian cortex. I'll describe a new microscope that we built and some analytic uh, methods that we developed to address the question. And in the majority of my talk, I'll be discussing imaging techniques that make use of what's called uh, calcium imaging methodologies. And I'll describe this in a little bit more detail for those of you that are not familiar with it. But basically this is a way of tracking a proxy of uh, neural depolarization by using the calcium in rush to neurons that accompanies it. And then in the third part, I'll describe what we learned and some of the conceptual advances. I'll show you uh, direct evidence for the presence of correlated noise fluctuations in large ensembles of, correlated, uh, of uh, cortical neurons. I'll show you that mouse uh, perceptual visual acuity is roughly consistent with our measurements of cortical noise power. And uh, most recently, we've found that these shared fluctuations, shared, shared noise fluctuations across neurons, are, uh, they have a correlation structure that is actually correlated itself across different time scales from seconds to days. And this actually has interesting implications regarding the reliability with which one might decode signals from the brain. Then I'll show you that an animal's visual signals that it's receiving from the outside world and its visual decisions are encoded in orthogonal non-interfering signal streams in the cortex, which presumably gives each of these uh, a level of robustness to interference from the other. And so overall, I'm trying to give you some, uh, some new glimpses of how we think the cortex may compute accurately uh, in the face of very substantial neural noise. 
And then if I have time at the end, I'll briefly describe some new technologies we've been working on in the lab. Uh, robotic microscope and methods for optical voltage imaging that allow us to directly probe uh, neural membrane potential. And that will give us a sense of what's coming up perhaps in years ahead. Okay, so the first part. So what factors might bound the fidelity of sensory neural coding? Now, interestingly, this is an old issue and one that was really first highlighted by John von Neumann when he started to think about the digital computer. And he pointed out in this really seminal volume, The Computer in the Brain, that the limiting factors on the accuracy of computation in the digital computer are really quite different from those in the brain due to the fact that the underlying components in the computer are very reliable, whereas the components in the brain, i.e. the neurons, are not reliable at all. They fluctuate a lot in their dynamics. Even if we present an animal um, with the same stimulus again and again, the neurons in the sensory system, for example, will respond very differently from trial to trial. And nonetheless, it was known fairly early on that the mammalian brain can, can in the face of this neural noise, perform quite reliably. So for example, it was known for weak flashes of light that humans could perceive in handfuls of photons uh, as shown by work as early as the 1940s. And subsequent work in the physiological community showed that, again, for weak stimuli, the limits on perception seem to be set by the front end, if you will, the primary sensory neurons that actually do the transduction between photons and electrical signals that we would ultimately perceive as visual scenes. And this was shown uh, in, the, uh, in the rods, in the retina, as well as the retinal ganglion cells would send the downstream messages to the visual uh, system. Nonetheless, there was the question of, well, what limits perceptual accuracy if you have a visual stimulus with more photons and you're not in that weak signal limit? Well, work done by Bill Newsom here at Stanford, uh, along with other uh, colleagues of his in the lab, uh, suggested that when he recorded from the cortex of a monkey viewing visual stimuli comprised of random dots moving to, to the left or to the right, that the accuracy with which a monkey could discern the overall balance of dots moving left or right actually coincided rather well with what the experimenter could deduce from simply recording the activity patterns of individual neurons in the visual cortex. And at first blush, this seemed like a real paradox because one is naturally led to ask, well, why is the monkey not doing much better, say, than you would do from listening to a single neuron? Can't the monkey, can't the monkey's brain pull signals across many neurons and thereby do much better through averaging and so forth? So to resolve this conundrum, Newsom and colleagues proposed that there might be correlated fluctuations within populations of neurons in the visual cortex. And even weak correlations could have substantial consequences at the scale of large ensembles. So this is a classic calculation they did, a very simple calculation, assuming that there was a pool of neurons that had similar response properties. And they examined different cases with different pairwise noise correlation coefficients uh, given by these R values. And they found that, you know, unlike the case in which you could uh, average more and more neurons and get better and better signal to noise ratio if there were no pairwise noise correlations, even if there was a very slight correlation in the fluctuations between pairs of neurons, at the, and the limit of large numbers of neurons has actually had a very substantial effect. So for example, here, you know, if R equals 0.05, you nonetheless get this plateau that caps and saturates the signal to noise level that one can attain by averaging. And it's much more substantial, of course, if you have greater uh, noise correlation coefficient values. And the other interesting thing about this graph is that to see this effect, it suggests that we need large recordings, which uh, when Bill was doing his work were not, not, a, not available. Now this calculation was done assuming neurons of identical response properties, but subsequently it was generalized to ensembles with diverse tuning properties. And I'm gonna illustrate this uh, using the world's simplest neural ensemble of only two neurons. And what this graph is, in, this set of graphs is intended to illustrate is the fact that uh, positive or negatively correlated noise can either help or impede uh, sensory coding depending upon uh, whether neurons are similarly or dissimilarly tuned to a stimulus. So here in this very simple ensemble, we have uh, two stimuli that I'd like you to imagine we're presenting to an animal, stimulus one and stimulus two. And in each trial, in each presentation of this, uh, one of the other stimulus, we record the activities of neuron one and neuron two. And then imagine that I ask you to decode or to tell me which stimulus was presented based on the joint activity of this pair of cells. And here uh, in the first column, I've got a case in which um, 
the, the cell's noise fluctuations are not correlated in the middle column. It's a case where their fluctuations are positively correlated and in the right column is a case in which they are negatively correlated. And on the top row, the two neurons are, are, are similarly tuned to stimulus uh, one and two, and in the bottom, they're differently tuned. And what you can sort of see from these graphs with the uh, decision boundaries uh, shown in the dashed line is that it's only the component of the noise um, orthogonal to the decision boundary or parallel to the tuning curve, as we would say, that affects the fidelity of your ability to perform this discrimination. So along this, this red dotted line, it's this component of the noise. If the tuning and the noise correlations have the same sense, uh, this discrimination has become harder. But it, for example, if you've got uh, uh, similarly tuned neurons, but uh, negative noise correlations, the discrimination becomes easier. And so this, uh, this way of looking at it, that it's, uh, that it's the noise along the signal tuning direction is what generalizes to ensembles of cells with heterogeneous uh, responses to stimuli. So there have been a, a, a wide body of, of theoretical studies of this kind of, of issue. But what had been missing for a long time was a direct test of the accuracy limits of cortical coding in uh, large ensembles of cells. Uh, in an awake uh, animal. And this was simply due to limits on um, the recording modalities that we had available in the field. And so we addressed this issue in the primary visual cortex, uh, often called area V1. And we looked at whether or not correlated neural noise, in fact, uh, limits the, the fidelity of coding in uh, the V1 area of, of, of mice. And so these are the questions that we had going into the study. And so first of all, we wanted to know whether or not there truly was a bound on the fidelity of coding as conveyed to us by a neocortical neural ensemble? And if so, did this bound in fact arise from the presence of correlated neural noise? And then we also wanted to know what was the, uh, the size of the ensemble at which we might uh, see uh, a noise limit to the accuracy of encoding. We wanted to know whether or not the signal to noise ratio that you would estimate from recordings of, 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 of cortical cell dynamics might correspond to measurements of a mouse's ability to actually perceive the, the outside world, i.e. its visual acuity. And finally, we wanted to see if we could get some insights into von Neumann's question, namely, how does the brain manage uh, neural noise to facilitate accurate computation? So these were our, our questions. And to address these, we needed a combination of different uh, methods to be able to directly observe the noise patterns of neural ensembles. So we needed, first of all, to be able to monitor large numbers of, of neurons, to preferably over a thousand at, uh, at once. And we wanted to be able to track the neurons across the entire retinotopic map. So the, in the brain, there are maps of an entire visual scene. We wanted to be able to sample neurons looking at different portions of the, uh, of the visual world. Uh, we had a, uh, developed some analytic techniques, which I'll describe, to process and, and analyze the terabyte size video data sets. Um, and also to extract neural noise power and so forth. And as I'll show you, this allowed us to measure, in fact, the fidelity of V1 neural population uh, coding. And so what I'm going to do now is describe some of these, these techniques. So as I mentioned at the outset, most of what I'll be discussing today uses a method called optical calcium imaging. And this is a, this is a way of getting at a proxy of neural activity and makes use of the fact that nearly all neuron types express voltage-gated calcium channels such that when the neuron depolarizes, there's an inrush of calcium ion into the cell. And this has prompted neuroscientists and others to develop uh, fluorescent calcium indicators. These are uh, fluorescent proteins that are, whose photophysical properties are sensitive to the presence of these calcium ions, and they can be genetically encoded in neurons of interest. And so they work as follows. Um, they typically couple a fluorophore to a protein that has a calcium binding motif. And so this binding motif will um, we'll grab some of the calcium ions that rush into the neuron uh, during uh, the voltage depolarization of a cell. And um, this binding of the calcium ion to the reporter will modify its fluorescent properties uh, in the indicator that's used most commonly in neuroscience known as GCAMP, it will modify its absorption uh, spectra. And this will manifest as a time during change in fluorescence intensity, which conveys information about uh, the neurons uh, spiking particularly when you image the cell body. And I'm gonna show you what this looks like. So this is a very simple movie that we gathered in the uh, mouse neocortex. And those flashing spots that you're seeing, particularly on the right, where I've subtracted the background, those are individual neurons in the cortex firing bursts of action potentials. And you're seeing this by way of the change in fluorescence that I just described. 
Now, a very common imaging modality for tracking these uh, calcium-induced changes in fluorescence is a two-photon fluorescence microscopy, a laser scanning modality. And the reason that this is commonly used is that two-photon two excited fluorescence is a convenient way of imaging deeper into highly scattering uh, brain tissue. And I'm gonna just summarize very quickly the advantages of two-photon uh, fluorescence microscopy over, uh, for example, confocal fluorescence microscopy. So because we are using um, short pulses of infrared light, femtosecond pulses, to excite a, a two-photon uh, excitation event, um, first of all, there's the added penetration into tissue due to the use of the infrared light, meaning that there's less scattering on the illumination side. And the fact that you have a nonlinear process to excite the fluorescence of interest means that um, there's very little fluorescence generated outside the focal spot. And so you can essentially move your laser spot throughout the tissue, voxel by voxel, and interrogate the tissue without worrying about fluorescence being excited from um, out of focal plane uh, locations. And so this gives rise to what's called inherent uh, optical sectioning or depth sectioning. Um, if fluorescence photons scatter on back, back on route to the detector, we can nonetheless catch them all scattered and, and unscattered. So we have a superior detection strategy as compared to confocal microscopy, which is the pinhole that's been placed in front of the detector to uh, enable 3D sectioning. The use of the infrared light also typically reduces phototoxicity and photo, uh, photo bleaching. And altogether, this approach generally allows one to penetrate more deeply into highly scattering uh, brain tissue. So this slide gives you some quick comparisons. Um, confocal microscopy might penetrate about 50 to 100 microns deep at very best, whereas two photon microscopy can penetrate maybe five, 700, and if things are arranged optimally, perhaps even as deep as a millimeter. So we set about to build a large two photon microscope that would allow us to track uh, neocortical excitatory neurons. And we wanted to do this of, of across a retinotopic map that corresponded to an entire visual scene. And so to attain this field of view, we built a, a microscope that actually had 16 uh, laser beams. Um, these were beams that were uh, multiplexed off a single titanium sapphire laser. And by doing so, we were able to cover a very broad area, uh, about four millimeters squared, and to scan these beams at an overall frame rate equivalent to a 20, uh, 20 hertz uh, frame acquisition rate in, in behaving mice. So I'm going to give you now in the next few slides a sense of how this, how this instrument works. So as you can imagine, we have uh, 16 illumination pathways, and so we're going to be arranging these beams to scan across the brain tissue in a four by four checkerboard pattern. And we also have 16 corresponding uh, photomultiplier tubes on the detection side. Now, because of the nonlinearity in the two photon excitation, it's advantageous to uh, adopt a, um, a temporal multiplexing a strategy um, because there's a, it's, it's better to, uh, to have more intense beams on for a shorter period of time than uh, simply to cut your beam into uh, your original beam into 16 um, different constituents. And so to uh, to achieve this, we divided the 16 beams into four sets of four, each of which was on for a quarter of a, of a pixel acquisition time. So, so um, we uh, were cycling through these using um, three electro optic modulators at a time scale that's on the sub microsecond scale. And so here you can see, you know, some of the timing signals that allow us to chop each pixel clock into, into fourths. And so all 16 detectors are always active. And so in any one of these cycles, four of the detectors will be catching, catching the primary fluorescence signals generated from the four corresponding beams. The other 12 will be catching fluorescence photons that may have scattered across uh, imaging tiles. However, we generally can figure out which, from which tile a photon has scattered if it lands in one of these other 12 tiles. And that allows us to computationally unmix the crosstalk. And so this slide shows you what that looks like. So on the left, you would see an unmixed image, which is simply be the composite of those four sets of four, simply summing them together. And on the right, you can see what it looks like after we've unmixed the crosstalk um, between tiles that were on and tiles that were uh, not being excited. And this slide shows you that um, after the unmixing, uh, we can record neural calcium activity traces uh, quite faithfully. And you can show this using various control experiments in which, for example, you might record uh, signals with only one of these beams on. And then you can also sample what the crosstalk might look like by having this beam off and all the other checkers on. And, and you can show uh, that um, with proper unmixing, uh, you're able to faithfully recover the signals that you would have attained if you had only one beam at a time. 
Okay, so now I'm going to show you what some of the data look like. So we can sample in this way an entire uh, primary visual cortex in a wake mouse. So the mouse is looking at a computer monitor, and we can show it various uh, visual stimuli. And in this way, we can examine how the visual cortex, or in particular the primary visual cortex, is encoding the visual scenes, how it's encoding what the mouse is seeing. And so this was work led by uh, Oleg Romyantsev, um, who was the primary person that built the microscope. He was an applied physics graduate student. He did this with postdoc Jerome Lecoq. And we were also collaborating with Hong Kui Zhang, who is now the, uh, the head of the Allen Institute for Brain Science. And she developed a transgenic mouse that we used. And this mouse expressed one of these genetically encoded calcium indicators in a particular class of excited tori neuron. So this, here's one of the early data sets. You can probably make out the four by four checkerboard pattern from the 16 beams scattering, uh, scanning the brain. These little twinkling spots, these are individual neuronal cell bodies showing you their activity patterns while the awake mouse is uh, watching the video monitor. And this is one of the later movies. And here, I think we've done a better job on the stitching. You probably cannot see the four by four checkers as well. And in this movie, I think you can also see not only some of the cell body activation, but also some of the dendritic patterns of activation, these branches coming out from the cell bodies. These are the dendrites. Now, if I show you this movie, it's, it probably is hard for you to figure out from this representation of the visual world, what the animal is actually watching on the video monitor. But in other brain areas, you can actually deduce this. And so I'm just gonna show you an example. So this is a movie taken with the same microscope in the, in the superior colliculus. And in this case, we're showing moving bars across the monitor and you can see a corresponding image of the bar sweeping across the superior colliculus. And so you can really you know, deduce the, um, the, the, the timing of the bar and also the direction of motion you know, on the screen when you see the image sweeping across across the brain. And, and so, so you get the sense that in cortex, there's a somewhat sparse representation of the visual world, but here in the colliculus, it's obviously less sparse. You can basically read the mouse's you know, mind, if you will, or see what he's seeing just by watching the brain. Okay, so now back to the question uh, at hand. So are there bounds on the fidelity of sensory cortical coding, visual coding that we could discern using this system? And so we set up a pretty uh, simple experiment. So we showed mice uh, two different uh, moving gratings, as they're called. So these were patterns of, of dark and bright bars that would drift across the screen. And they were oriented at plus or minus 30 degrees relative to the vertical, and they were shown for uh, two seconds. And we randomly alternated between each of these two patterns um, for uh, a couple hundred trials per, uh, per mouse. And so the mouse was- vertical axis here. It's, they're oriented to the mouse as you're seeing them on the screen. These are the exact stimuli that we showed. Yeah. And so then the question is, if, if we record the evoked activity in the cortex, how well can we uh, differentiate between these two stimuli just based on the neural activity? So Oleg developed a computational pipeline to process uh, the data sets, which were about 10 terabytes or so in size. And I'm just going to summarize rather quickly um, the different stages of this pipeline. I don't have time to go into all the details, but you know, first there was some, uh, some pre-processing steps, and these were sort of housekeeping operations, like uh, correcting for slightly different uh, gains across the different PMTs, correcting for any kind of brain motion uh, artifacts that might move the tissue back and forth. These can be just computationally registered. And next, we had to identify individual cells within these movies and extract their locations and corresponding activity traces. Um, and then we started the, the main analysis, which is to analyze the patterns of activity from these from these neurons. So when we uh, started to examine these neurons, we found um, that, as expected, there were some neurons that would respond to uh, one of the two stimuli. And when we looked at the uh, noise correlation coefficient, so meaning if you have two neurons, you know, what are the odds that their responses will be correlated from trial to trial, we found that there were, uh, on average, uh, slightly positive correlations. Uh, and the values of these correlation coefficients were roughly consistent with what had been measured uh, previously. Now, to, to differentiate between the two stimuli based on the, uh, the whole set of responses we were getting across uh, large numbers of neurons, a, a thousand or more, um, we had a computational challenge. So we had to assess neuron and assess noise in a large population of, of neurons. So N is on the order of a thousand or more. And uh, the noise covariance matrix is going to have on the order of n squared elements. And so we're not going to be able to measure all those matrix elements uh, accurately if we try to uh, assess them individually. If we have uh, P-stimulus trials, 
with P on the order of 200. So that was about the order of magnitude of the number of trials we could get a mouse to, to tolerate, if you will, what's watching this monitor. If, so P is gonna be uh, substantially less than N. We're just not gonna have enough data to determine each element of the, uh, each, each, each matrix elements of the noise covariance matrix. On the other hand, if we wanna be able to create a linear decoder, basically a decision boundary, in the high dimensional space, the n dimensional space of neural activity, um, this only requires uh, n parameters. And so from that perspective, having a p times n measurements uh, might be sufficient. And so this was the uh, perspective and the, the approach that we took. So you should imagine sort of an n dimensional space on each trial, you're gonna get at least uh, n measurements, one from each of the cells um, in response to the stimulus presentation. And so in this uh, n-dimensional space, to create a linear decoder, what we want to do is to create a hyperplane that would separate the responses to the one stimulus versus the, the neural responses to the other stimulus. And so the question is then, how do we find um, this optimal hyperplane? So the way that we did this was as follows. So we first performed a dimensional reduction in this n-dimensional space using a partial least a squares analysis that identified uh, dimensions that were important for our decoding problem. And then we constructed uh, decoders uh, in this uh, reduced space. So I'm going to give you a sense of sort of what this uh, looks like by showing you a simplified schematic with two of the dimensions identified by this partially squares or PLS uh, approach. And so imagine that you now have the neural dynamics moving in this, um, in this space of reduced dimensionality. So, and I've indicated the responses of the population to the two different stimuli, say A and B, on many different trials. So, as you show the stimulus, the population might start here. And then, as if you're showing stimulus A, the activity might follow something along this path. Whereas, if you're showing stimulus B, this might be a more you know, representative path. And so, then the question is how do we differentiate between those two, two families of, of neural trajectories? And so, we would like to come up with a decision boundary as schematized by this dotted uh, green line. So what we can do is to construct a decoder that will optimally differentiate, a uh, linear decoder that will opt optimally differentiate between the, these two. Uh, and, we, and we did this by constructing a Fisher uh, linear discriminant in this uh, reduced dimensionality space. And this gives us uh, a measure D prime of the decoding uh, uh, fidelity. And the way you should think about this uh, D prime value, it can be thought of statistically as a Cohen's D, or you can think about it as a signal to noise uh, ratio. It is essentially equivalent to the distance between the centers of these two distributions. So at any time after stimulus onset, I can look at the, um, the center of the distributions of the responses to stimulus A or stimulus B, and look at how well separated they are. I'm calling that delta mu. And then orthogonal to the decision boundary, you can look at the noise or the spread in these distributions. So essentially the width of these, these uh, ellipsoids uh, along the dimension that we care about. And that will give us a D prime. And then one can also show that the square of D prime is actually a discrete analog of the Fisher information, which is telling us sort of how much information the neural activity is conveying to us about which, uh, about which stimulus was shown on the monitor. So I'm gonna show you some examples of this with, with real data. So, um, these are examples at 0.15 seconds after stimulus onset and at one second after stimulus onset. So the stimulus lasts for about two seconds. And so you can see initially uh, with these blue and red points that the representations of the two stimuli start off pretty similar. They're hard to differentiate at early times. You can nevertheless see that there is some correlated noise. You can see that these ellipsoids are, are tilted. So there is uh, visible correlated noise in, in these cortical neurons. And these, pop these responses become uh, easier to separate as time evolves within the stimulus presentation. So you can see by one second, we can pretty easily draw a decision boundary that will allow us to accurately determine whether the mouse was shown stimulus A or stimulus B. Now, due to the presence of the correlated noise, the decision boundary should be tilted appropriately to accommodate the tilt of the noise distribution. So if you were to completely ignore uh, the noise, dis the, the noise uh, covariance, you would draw this, this uh, uh, black dotted line, which we'd, you would call a diagonal decoder. So this is how we would refer to a decoder that does not take into account the noise covariance matrix, but it is more optimal to, to take these into account. And so this would be the green dotted line. Now we can also uh, do control analyses in which we shuffle the neurons responses across trials. So because we have so many presentations on the order of 100 presentations of A, 100 presentations of B, we can statistically break 
the uh, correlated responses of the individual cells by uh, what's called trial shuffling, basically mixing them across trials. So this preserves the statistics of any individual cells responses, but breaks pairwise and higher order correlations. And in this case, you can see that now the distributions are more spherical um, and in fact would be easier to uh, decode due to, the, um, uh, due to the uncorrelated noise. Now, Surya did some uh, important calculations to show that this partial least uh, squares analysis uh, allowed us to accurately determine D prime values and the principal modes of the uh, noise covariance matrix, even though we had far fewer experimental trials than neurons that we uh, were uh, recording. And so he uh, did a number of calculations and I'll just very quickly uh, summarize these here, looking at our estimates of fissure information to you know, what would be the underlying actual fissure information and showed that as we recorded from uh, more cells, we actually needed fewer trials to, to acquire uh, accurate estimates. And this was actually contrary to the, to the conventional wisdom in the field, which had posited that the more cells you recorded from, the more trials you would need. And it was, in fact, this was uh, not the case. So the key question then we wanted to answer with this data was how does D prime, the fidelity with which you might uh, differentiate between these two stimuli, how does it scale with N, the number of neurons that are reported? And specifically, at large numbers of neurons, do we find the predicted saturation that I showed you at the beginning of the talk in uh, the Newsom calculations? Now, as we do this analysis, we can perform an important uh, control, namely that if we take the very same data, but we perform this trial shuffling operation to break uh, the pairwise um, correlations between cells, the D prime should, should not plateau. Without correlated noise, there should be no saturation in the, in the fidelity. So here are the results for the, uh, for the real data and the shuffled data. So the real data are shown in green, the trial shuffle data are shown in orange. And uh, on the left column, I'm plotting um, D prime values as a function of time from stimulus onset. So you can see after about 0.5 seconds, the fidelity of, of discriminating between these two stimuli uh, starts to, to saturate, especially in, in, in the case where we used instantaneous decoders. So this is what you construct a decoder based on individual time bin. We also looked at a different type of decoder, which we call the cumulative decoder, which we use all data up to a given uh, time bin. In both cases with the instantaneous and the cumulative decoders, we found that around a thousand neurons or so, you reach a, a saturation point. You can no longer improve the signal to noise ratio by further averaging, whereas in the shuffle data, the fidelity um, seems to grow without bound. So it seems that indeed we found uh, the predicted saturation. Now, we also found that if we constructed decoders that ignored um, the structure of the noise covariance matrix, we did slightly worse than the optimal linear decoders. Um, that's to be expected. And as, as I said, uh, optimal decoding requires about a thousand cells. So this, this sets the scale of the effect. And if you take the perspective of a downstream brain area that might be receiving these signals, this sort of tells you how many neurons that a downstream area might have to listen to before it sort of already reached its, its uh, coding optimum. This also has some implications for future forms of brain machine interfaces in, in which you might wanna know how many cells do I have to record from, from the cortex uh, to optimally discern a stimulus. And so this is sort of setting a, a general scale for, for, um, uh, for that kind of thing. Now, we also tried another set of stimuli that uh, were more similar in their orientations, plus or minus uh, six degrees relative to the vertical. And again, found a saturation of information at large numbers of neurons. Uh, the decoders, as you might expect, were not quite as good at differentiating um, plus or minus six degree gradings as opposed to plus or minus 30. But these measurements allowed us to estimate uh, how close an orientation a pair of gradings might be before you could no longer discriminate them based on neural activity in the cortex. And our estimate was about plus or minus 2.4 degrees, which is actually very close to the minimum discernible orientation difference um, seen in mice. So measurements of mouse uh, visual acuity give us about the same, same order of magnitude value. And it should be noted that mice have a substantially poorer acuity than, uh, than, than, than monkeys or humans. So humans can do substantially better. Uh, mice have poor acuity and it seems to match uh, the level of, of neural noise that we're seeing here in the cortex. So we're finding this saturation of D prime at large uh, ensembles of cells. And so then the question is, well, what is actually causing it? Um, is it in fact uh, correlated noise? And so this question is equivalent to asking, well, whether are, are there noise eigenvalues? 
um, that grow linearly with the number of cells that you've recorded like the visual signals. And so the ratios of these two would, would be presumably what would cause the saturation. So we took a look at the structure of the noise covariance matrix. And first we did a, a check. We verified that the signal power was, was uh, the signal was growing linearly with the, the uh, increasing sizes of the ensembles, the number of neurons. And unlike in shuffle data, where we found that there was no uh, uh, noise eigenmode that, that grew with the number of neurons recorded in the real data, there were actually several eigenmodes whose eigenvalues grew linearly with the number of neurons. And in every mouse that we looked at, we found uh, several noise eigenvalues that, that grew with n. This is shown here on a log plot. And interestingly, it was not the largest noise mode that was aligned with the signal. So in this slide, I'm showing you um, the extent to which each uh, noise eigenvector is aligned with the signal. And it's typically the uh, third largest noise mode we found. So for example, in this plot, here you can have, you see on the y-axis, the noise eigenvalue ver versus um, its component along the signal direction. And so here you can see noise mode one shown in the red, much larger than that in the green, but it's not aligned with the signal. So it doesn't actually limit your ability to decode the signal. It's this green mode, uh, which is the one that you're going to care about, because that's going to limit the ability to differentiate between the two stimuli. So when we looked at the proportion of the power that was actually limiting us, we found that it, it was only about 10% of the overall to total cortical noise power that was in the signal direction. About 90% of it was orthogonal and thus did not seem to impede the, 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 the coding of these two, these two stimuli. So to sum up this first experiment, uh, we found that pairwise noise correlation coefficients were small but measurable in the cortex. We found direct evidence for correlated noise in large ensembles of neurons. So this plateau we found about 1,000 cells or more. We found that every mouse had a few noise modes that grew linearly with the size of a neural ensemble, as did the visual signals. So it's the ratio of these two that's causing the, the plateau and the fidelity. It seems indeed that correlated noise is what's limiting coding accuracy as, been, as had been predicted um, about 20 years ago. And interestingly, the the level of the noise that we're seeing in the signal direction seems to be consistent with mouse visual acuity measurements that were made previously. Um, and we're seeing only about 10% of the noise seems to be what's actually limiting the decoding. And so I think this gives us some insight into uh, von Neumann's question. How does the brain compute so accurately in the face of noise? Well, in this case, it seems that the brain is not getting rid of the noise per se, but actually putting it into dimensions that don't matter. So it's managing the noise in an interesting way. We then went on to ask a follow-up question, which is related to what I've been discussing, which is how can sensory percepts be so reliable if sensory cortical neurons are so noisy? So if I were to show you an apple today and then the next day and then a week from now, um, you would tell me each time that you're seeing an apple. And of course, there are visual illusions, but in fact, the vast majority of our visual experience is really very reliable. And so how does the brain achieve that given, given so, much, uh, so much noise, so, many, so much uh, noise power in the, uh, in the neurons' responses to visual, visual stimuli? So this was a, a project that actually just came out recently. It was, again, a collaboration with Surya, this time led by graduate student Sadeg Ibrahimi. Uh, and in this experiment, instead of just having mice watch a, a video monitor, we had them performing an, an active visual discrimination task. So again, we showed them two different um, moving gratings on the screen. In this case, it was a horizontal grating and a, and a vertical grating. And the animals had to signal which one they were, uh, which one they were seeing by, by licking a water spout. And we used what's called a go-no-go a go no go a, a task structure in which uh, one of the stimuli, the horizontal grating, would prompt the animal to lick, whereas the animal was supposed to withhold his response to a vertical grating. And we trained them uh, to do this uh, well, and then we lowered the contrast to a, a low level such that they've got only about 80% of the trials uh, correct. And we tracked them doing this uh, for five days in each of six mice. And in this case, uh, what we did was we built a, uh, actually a, a large wide field fluorescence macroscope using one photon excitation. And this was something we did actually uh, a little bit after we, we um, built that large two photon microscope. And we were able to show through some control experiments that the signals we were getting were actually quite uh, good. And so I'm gonna show you what these, these videos look like. I think you can see the difference in quality. There's a substantial background fluorescence, and that's because we don't have this intrinsic 
optical sectioning. And in fact, the dynamic range of the fluorescence signals is substantially weaker than the two photon case, but we were able to computationally extract the neural transients uh, nevertheless. And I think you can, you can see how much smaller the cells look in this video because we're looking over a much broader area. And in fact, we were able to track the entire visual cortex, not just the primary visual cortex in this experiment, as well as some uh, parts of surrounding areas. So this little map here shows you that in addition to the visual areas that we, that we monitor, the primary visual cortex, lateral visual, medial visual, uh, posterior parietal cortex is also considered a visual area in the mouse. We also got data from some parts of auditory, somatosensory, motor, and retrosplenial cortex. So a wide portion of cortical uh, terrain. And across the six mice that we examined, uh, we were able to monitor over 21,000 cells. And nearly all of these uh, most of these cells were active for all five days of the study, as you can see here by the preponderance of brick red dots, with each dot representing the cell body of one of one neuron. So this uh, this graph shows you some of the uh, basic statistics of where we were able to record these cells and how many cells we got from each area. And you can see in the inset there that indeed most of the cells were active uh, over all all five days. We then examined the recordings and identified cells whose activity patterns would differentiate between the two types of stimuli that we were showing. And our initial analyses, uh, in our initial analyses, we focused on, on correctly performed trials. So correctly performed GO trials or correctly performed uh, no GO trials. And interestingly, we found that all of the areas that we examined had a high proportion of cells that were coders in the sense that they discriminated between these two different uh, types of trials. And we divided the uh, trial structure into different periods into a stimulus presentation period. There was a, a little delay period between the stimulus presentation and when we allowed the animal to respond. So there's a half second window there. So two seconds of stimulus presentation, a half second of delay, and then a so-called response period when the animal was allowed to, to lick. And we found um, neurons that would differentiate between the two types of correct trials in all three of these, uh, all three of these periods. And we focused, generally speaking, on the, st on the stimulus presentation period because we were interested in, in the stimulus coding. So then what we did was we constructed neural decoders using the same approach that I showed you earlier, using the PLS analysis to attain a space of reduced dimensionality and then constructing an optimal linear decoder in the reduced space. And this plot on the left shows the accuracy with which we can decode or discriminate between these two stimuli in each one of these eight brain areas or by using all the data together at once uh, in the black curve. That's the curve for all the, all the brain areas. And so you can see that within about 200 milliseconds after stimulus onset, um, the neurons are faithfully encoding the identity uh, of the stimulus and it drops a little bit during the, the, the delay period. We then took a look at how the representation of the stimulus might be time varying by looking at the, the uh, Pearson's correlation coefficient between all the decoders that we had created individually for each time band. And so this uh, matrix of correlation coefficients between the decoders is shown here on the right. So right here is stimulus onset where my cursor is. You can see that the decoders are changing fairly rapidly, but after about 0.5 seconds, they settle down. And so all these decoders are really quite similar to each other, where my mouse is here. And so it seems as if there's a stable representation that has emerged uh, in the brain after about 0.5 seconds into stimulus presentation. Now, in addition to the representation of the stimulus changing, we also found that the efficiency of these representations were time varying. So we did uh, an analysis of the efficiency of the coding or the redundancy uh, using the same kind of uh, approach that I showed you earlier in Oleg's data and we would, in which we would look at the saturation, the saturation of information at large numbers of cells. And we would characterize this by using the uh, half saturation point. And then we overlaid these curves normalized to their plateau. And what you can see here is that at early times, these, uh, these curves show that one saturates very quickly with smaller numbers of neurons, about 300 or so, but at later times in the stimulus presentation, more numbers of neurons are needed, their signals are needed to be able to uh, differentiate the two stimuli uh, accurate, accurately. So it looks like the brain is actually encoding the stimulus in a time varying way, such that it encodes it very redundantly immediately after stimulus onset, but then becomes more efficient as the stimulus presentation uh, proceeds. And so the, the, uh, the kinetics of this are shown here on the left. So this 
value on the y-axis is uh, n uh, 0.5 to the, the number of cells that you need to attain half maximum. And so you can see immediately after stimulus presentation, this number drops, indicating uh, a, um, a high redundancy of encoding. And then subsequently after about 200 milliseconds, the representation becomes uh, more efficient and less redundant. Now the kinetics of this actually were quite similar to the pairwise noise correlation coefficients. And that's shown here on the right. Now, what was interesting in this experiment was that we only saw pairwise noise correlations between pairs of cells that had similar tuning to the two stimuli. So cells that would respond either to the horizontal grading or to the vertical grading, but we typically did not see uh, shared fluctuations between uh, pairs of neurons that were oppositely tuned or neurons that were untuned. So this was a little different from the, the case in which the mouse was just um, passively watching the monitor. And the, the measurements at the cellular scale, looking at these pairwise noise correlation coefficients, uh, were inversely related to the coding efficiency that we were determining at the level of the entire neural population. So that's shown by this graph. You can see this, um, this inverse relationship between uh, the N0.5 values and um, the pairwise noise correlation coefficients pairwise noise correlation coefficient values. And each uh, data point here is encoded with a particular shade of blue. The shade indicates the mouse that we uh, use in that given Im imaging session. And what you can see here is that nearly all six mice uh, seem to fall along this line. So each dot is from a given mouse in a given imaging session. So there's, uh, there's a variation in the efficiency of the code and the pairwise noise correlation coefficients, but they all fall along this line. And that is an interesting prediction, actually even a very simple feed forward network models of visual processing. Um, and the particular slope, uh, the fact that it seems to be relatively universal across mice, we think is a reflection of similar uh, connectivity in the cortex across different animals. So probably some universal feature of uh, the murine cortex. So we're seeing, uh, important correlations between neurons in the cortex in this task. And then we took a look at how important accounting for these correlations were in performing the decoding. So the first thing we did was to examine, well, how well can you take a single decoder and decode the stimulus across all five days? So that pertains to this question I asked at the outset, well, you know, why, is, why, why may, might we see an apple in the same way today, tomorrow, and next week? So how well can a single decoder um, decode these two stimuli across all five days of our experiment. So you might not necessarily expect it to work because there are, there are fluctuations in the neural responses across time scales, across the, the handful of seconds from trial to trial, but also across day to day. However, we found that it was possible to create what we called a common decoder, a decoder that would apply well to all days of the experiments. And we actually compared these common decoders and their performances to those of decoders that were trained and tested just on the data from individual days. And in fact, the common decoders did slightly better than the single day decoders, indicating that they can exist and that there, there is a, a representation that actually works across at least all five days of the experiment. We then looked at the, the performance differences between decoders that took account of correlated uh, neural noise and diagonal decoders that did not account for neural noise. And uh, here on the right, you can see for each animal in each imaging session, the decoding performance is assessed by D prime squared, the Fisher information for decoders that were optimal in the sense they took account of the correlated noise versus the diagonal decoders. And so you can see in nearly all cases, taking into account of the neural noise uh, correlations matters, but particularly so for these common decoders that are working across days. So in, in other words, if you wanna be able to attain the reliability in decoding the visual world, it seems like you really have to take into account those those shared correlations across neurons. Now, why might be that? Why, 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 why might be that the case? So we took a look at how the trial-to-trial -trial neural fluctuations relate to the day-to-day -day fluctuations, and what we found was something that actually had never been hypothesized or surmised in the field, namely that the the second-by-second correlations between neurons actually had a very similar statistical structure as the day-to-day -day fluctuations. And so this graph is, is showing you this. On the x-axis, I have um, the noise eigen modes arranged by their power. So the first would be the, the strongest going across to the weakest on the far right. And then I've taken that eigen mode and, it, and, and showing you on the y-axis its component along the day-to-day the -day change in the neural signal, the average neural signal. And it, it turns out, as shown by the purple data points, that they seem to be closely aligned. 
And this was not the case when we actually did the, the shuffling to break, um, break the neural noise correlation. So it seems that there's this very interesting similarity in shared neural fluctuations across, uh, across time scales from seconds to days. And so therefore, if we construct a decoder that can account for the trial to trial correlated noise, it's gonna be naturally robust to the day-to-day -day variations that we see in the neural coding. And so that potentially can explain why we can perceive visual stimuli uh, so reliably across time. Now, when we, we took a look at the relationships between different brain areas and how well they could individually um, represent these visual stimuli. And we found that scores from our decoders, the outputs were actually highly correlated from trial to trial uh, across different brain areas. So you can see here on the left graph, an example from uh, decoders looking at activity in area B1, the primary visual cortex and somatosensory cortex, you can see that um, uh, the, the, the scores are highly correlated. Each data point represents the score from these two brain areas across an individual trial. And when we plotted the dynamics of these, uh, these, these pairwise uh, correlations across brain areas, we found that they were very time varying. So the score correlations peaked at about 200 milliseconds after a stimulus presentation and then continued to decline during the rest of the stimulus presentation. And this gives rise to a redundancy in the encoding of the stimulus that is also time dependent. So those score correlations allowed us to estimate that there was about a threefold encoding redundancy of the stimulus across the cortex that arises uh, within 200 milliseconds after we flashed the, the stimulus on the screen and then decayed back toward about one, no redundancy as the stimulus uh, persisted on the monitor. Finally, we took a look at the shared noise modes across different uh, cortical areas. And so we did this using a method known as canonical correlation analysis to look at all pairs of brain areas and all shared noise modes. And this gives you back um, a, a hierarchy of, of noise modes from the most, powerful, uh, the most powerful noise modes that are shared, say, between two brain areas and weaker modes. And interestingly, what we found was that the primary noise mode across all pairs actually turned out to have the same structure. So regardless of which pair of brain areas we took, the CCA showed us that the primary mode actually had a very similar activity pattern, regardless of what the, the partner might be. Whereas when we looked at the secondary modes, we found that there were groups of brain areas that were um, co-fluctuating in a similar manner. We then took a look at what these different noise modes might be encoding. So what signals might be encoded in these noise mode directions? And uh, the result was very interesting. We found that in this global noise mode, was encoded the animal's upcoming response. So the animal had not yet responded. That happens later in the trial, but starting around 600 milliseconds after stimulus presentation and peaking at around one second after the stimulus goes on, we can see signals in this global noise mode direction that are telling us what the animal is about to do. So we can actually use this to predict the animal's response. Whereas in the secondary noise modes, we find information about what stimulus was shown. So it looks as if um, the brain is actually encoding the visual data and the mouse's response in these non-interfering orthogonal uh, directions. And that will presumably also promote faithful communication across uh, different brain areas. So to sum up what I've just told you in this experiment, uh, we found that in an active visual task in which we require the mice to respond, uh, coding efficiency is, is time varying. The redundancy of encoding uh, peaks about 200 milliseconds after a stimulus onset. The visual representation seems to stabilize about a half second after stimulus onset. Um, from this, these uh, representations, we can reliably decode the stimuli across a days of the experiment. And this is largely due to the similarity of the correlated noise patterns across time scales from seconds to days, allowing the decoders to have what we call a dual robustness across these time scales. Uh, and then when we looked across cortical areas, we found this hierarchy of noise fluctuation modes that seem to encode the visual data and the mouse's decisions in these non-interfering uh, orthogonal patterns. And so interestingly, the visual decision seems to be the one that is broadcast globally across cortex. So all, all the cortical areas seem to have a, a report of what the animal is actually about to do, at least some representation of it. And then I've got a few slides showing you sort of techniques that we're working on to allow us to further conduct um, neuroscience studies of these kinds. And I'll go through these very quickly because I know we started a little bit late. So one of the things that has been a limitation of everything I showed you is that in the, in the imaging methods that I discussed in the majority of the talk here, we've been limited to contiguous brain areas. But in many cases, brain areas might be separated anatomically, but um, close topologically in uh, the brain circuit. And so we've been interested in coming up with ways to probe 
uh, connected pairs of brain areas that might be separated. And so one way that we've been working on doing this is to implant optical probes um, in distal areas and image them concurrently. And so we've developed a, a microscope which has different arms, a two photon scanning microscope with different ro the, uh, a set of robotic arms that we can actually position across different brain areas. We started off with a double armed uh, microscope to start, to start simply. This was work done by Jerome Lecoq. So we built a, a two arm, two photon microscope, each arm terminating in a, um, a gradient refractive index lens that could be positioned across a brain area of interest. So we could do this over relatively nearby areas, such as two visual areas or areas that might be a little further separated apart. And because they're micro lenses, we can even image deep areas. So for example, in this case, we've got a superficial area, the frontal cortex and a deeper area, the hippocampus. So this approach is complementary to what I've been showing you before, in which we have big fields of view, but we're limited to contiguous brain areas. So I'm gonna show you an example of this. So here's a, a case in which a, a mouse has been trained to do an arm pulling assay. And we're looking at two distal areas that are both part of the motor system, the cerebellum and the motor cortex. And we can track activity in these two brain areas as the mouse does its task. And here's another example in which we've added now two fluorescent colors. We're looking at two different types of neurons in the basal ganglia, a deep area, and again, the motor cortex as an animal is learning to walk on this, um, this ladder wheel. And then more recently, we've been adding more arms. So Tony Kim has now constructed a, ro a robot with four arms, each arm a two photon microscope. And here's an example where this is only showing three arms at work, but here you have three concurrently acquired movies of brain activity in an awake behaving mouse. And so now we have a lot of freedom to march around at least you know, sets of four brain areas at a time and try to understand how brain areas may be uh, communicating to construct behavior. The last thing I wanna tell you about very quickly is how we're going beyond calcium imaging. So I described in the beginning how calcium imaging uses a proxy of neural activity um, to tell us what neurons are doing, namely the inrush of calcium that occurs when neurons depolarize. But more recently, we and others in the field have been looking at so-called optical voltage indicators, which can provide a fluorescent report of the transmembrane voltage of the cell directly. And our work on this was actually started by uh, postdoc Yang Gong, who did his PhD with uh, Yelena Vukovic here at Stanford. And he developed a class of fluorescent indicators, which we call the FRET opsin sensors. So these are protein fusions of a bright fluorescent protein and an opsin protein that has a voltage sensitive absorption coefficient. So the fluorescent protein acts as a FRET donor. The opsin is acting as a voltage dependent FRET acceptor. And so when the membrane depolarizes, we see an improvement in FRET efficiency that manifests as a decrease in fluorescence, which can be good enough to track the neuronal membrane voltage. So here you see an example from uh, some of Yang's recordings, an electrically recorded trace of neural activity in the bottom, and you see the optical trace which is nearly identical uh, in, the, in the blue at the top. And we used this in awake mice and we showed that we could track each and every spike in, a, in an awake running mouse. And we could time those spikes with about 200 microseconds spike timing precision. So much better than the timing accuracy that we would typically get with calcium imaging, which is more on the 100 millisecond scale. And recently with collaborators uh, at, at Yale, we've been um, pursuing the development of multiple fluorescent colors of these FRET opsin indicators so that we can tag different populations of neurons and watch their dynamics uh, concurrently. So here's an example of a recording done at Stanford by postdoc Simon Haziza showing you he can track spiking in two different populations of cortical neurons in a, in a running mouse using high-speed voltage imaging. Uh, and here's a, here's a nice example that I like from a, actually an awake behaving fly. So this is a Drosophila running in place on a ball as we're performing kilohertz imaging of spiking from three different neurons um, in a part of the, body, of the fly brain responsible for memory, the mushroom body. And finally, these indicators are interesting because they allow us to track brain waves or neural oscillations. And so we can look at activity of neurons below the spiking threshold. And of course, you know, brain waves were known and recorded as early as the 1920s, but it's been very hard to dissect which cell types or neuron types may be giving rise to these oscillations that we can record even in humans. But now that we have these voltage indicators which can be targeted to specific neuron classes, we can, I think, begin to deconstruct the contributions of individual cell types to, um, to brain oscillations. So just to sum up the, the technology part here, we've been pursuing uh, the construction of robotic two photon microscopes for imaging you know, multiple remotely situated brain areas, as well as these voltage indicators, which allow us to look at individual action potentials and transmembrane potential in awake animals, and also uh, voltage rhythms and oscillations in awake behaving animals. So I, I tried to mention most of the contributors as we went along, but here are additional contributors and also uh, some of the funding bodies that made this possible. So thank you.
Okay, do we have any questions? So the first one is to talk about the advantages of the two income uh, and how we hold it on to it up. Yeah, there are. So, so it's it's advantages are, are chiefly the depth, and because of the optical sectioning, we can typically resolve finer neural structures. Um, so, what you're going to see, and I think I think you can see this in some of the moves I was showing you, that you know the contrast of the images and the videos is much improved compared to the one photon. The disadvantage is the difficulty of obtaining large fields of view at reasonable frame rates. So if we can do that with say an epifluorescence instrument, um, that's probably gonna be technically easier, although you still have to you know, build a wide field of view instrument, um, but it's, you're gonna be able to record probably from more you know, brain tissue at once. Another disadvantage of the two photon is that you have to worry a little bit about heating effects. Um, you know, we were delivering you know, 16 beams of light to the brain. It, it actually produces a measurable temperature rise, which we had, I didn't go into this, but we had to um, start actually from a spot where the brain was at one or two degrees cool, and then we'd lift it back up. So we, had, we have to worry about heating effects. And there are also some subtleties to do with nonlinear forms of photo damage. Um, so, so it has some, has some disadvantages as well. And we use both techniques in the lab. Maybe I can come back to you. Yeah. So the video of this wave, the square wave going across the large the moving bar, yeah. The moving bar, that was particularly striking. And because I don't I wouldn't necessarily think that the spatial distribution of active neurons would match the spatial distribution of an image at a priori. Do you does is our model of vision actually say that that's an expected thing that you would need to show this amount of square rectangle? Yeah, so that's called the retinotopic representation, and that's actually been known for a for a long time, but it does ex does exist, um, and that exists also in the cortex. But you, there's a question of you know, first of all, how how faithful is it? You know, how finely resolved is it? Um, in the mouse cortex, the resolution is going to be substantially poorer than it would be, for example, in the in the primate or in the human. Um, now, if you really want to be able to just look at the movies and figure out what the animal is seeing, you not only need that retinotopic representation, but you're also going to need the activity to be um, you know, sufficiently dense in time that you can deduce it. And so I think one of the primary issues in the cortex is that the representation has already been sparsified somewhat, whereas that hasn't occurred in the colliculus. And I think that's a lot, a lot of what's allowing you to actually see, see the stimulus just by watching the, the movie. But in general, it's not going to be possible from the cortex. Yeah. Uh, can can you relate some the spike trains to the correlations of the noise? Somehow they've got to be related, but I don't know how you would do it. If your battery voltage fluctuates compared to intensity fluctuations. Oh, I, I think I understand your question. I'm not entirely sure. So when we did the analysis of um, the shared fluctuations in neural dynamics, we were reducing them to estimates of spikes. So it was not on the raw fluorescence traces. We were reducing them to estimated, estimated spike trains. Is that, does that answer your question? Well, but you've got two kinds of, of information, you know, some of them are spike trains and some of them are noise correlations. And I just want to know. Well, the spike trains are correlated. So, the, so, so let, me, let me try this as an answer. So, so we have two different stimuli, okay? So what we're interested in is mean, mean subtracted activity traces. So for example, if I show stimulus A 200 times, okay? And then I subtract out the mean response of the ensemble, okay? Then I'm just left with a noise just with the noise responses of the of the cells, okay? And then that that set of say, you know, a thousand cells has a noise covariance structure to stimulus A. Turns out it's actually pretty similar to the um, to the noise structure of the stimulus B. Okay. And so then I'm just using the, the residuals, if you will, to estimate the the noise covariance. Does that does that address your question? I mean, there's two ways of analyzing what's going on. And somehow they don't seem to group together. No, they're coming from the spike trains. That's how we're estimating them. Okay. Yeah. So it means it means, for example, I mean, maybe I should go back to the you know the the cartoon here, but um, it it means you know that 
each each cell is going to be stochastic, but they tend to act uh, stochastic together. So the point being that you know if cell A cell if I show you know one stimulus, a given cell is not going to respond in every trial. But if it does respond, then its neighbors you know might be also likely to respond. And when when a given cell is quiet, its neighbor might also be quiet. So they were expressing that through spikes, but their tendencies from trial to trial are, are correlated. Maybe we can ask uh, So the characteristics of noise correlation decoding, is that specific to the area of the brain or there are for redundancy or the same for retina for AV1 if there's a little bit uh, similar? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, most of the work to my knowledge is, um, with this kind of approach has been done in cortex. Um, so I mean, you I mean, you probably would know the retina data better than I would. You know, that's your specialty. But I, most of what I've seen has been in the cortex, um, and, or in cortical-like structures like the hippocampus. Like we've we've done some stuff in the hippocampus too. Would you say that this is the same kind of time constant, same redundancy that you have shown will be in the retina and the one we did before, or it is very specific to say the area? Well, you know, so the cortex has multiple retinotopic maps, right? So each. I mean, the way we, in fact, identify these different visual cortical areas is through so-called retinotopic mapping, which we would show moving stimuli across the across the visual, you know, monitor, video monitor, and then you would see basically corresponding movements across each and every visual cortical area, and that's typically how it's how it's done, including you know, in the humans and fMRI. In the retina, I mean, you, there's only one retinotopic map, although you may have multiple types of cells, each providing a retinotopic map. So. I'm not, I mean, maybe E.J. Tolchinsky has you know, measured the, the, the information redundancy across the retina, um, but clearly there's redundancy across these different visual cortical areas because they each have a represent, they each have their own representation of the visual world. Yeah, I would expect some convergence eventually for a cell that has a condition, right, like the grandmother cell. It responds to a specific stimulus and you don't need that as well. Yeah, and I think it also depends, you know, it should be borne in mind, you kept in mind that the, our, our measures of redundancy are, um, you know, for these two stimuli that we've chosen, right? And so, so when the mouse is actually encoding the entire visual scene, it's presumably encoding a lot more than just the identities of the two stimuli, right? So I, I would expect that, you know, the retina probably has a much finer representation of the visual world as would be the early parts of the visual system. And I think, as you're saying, as you go up the visual hierarchy, you might have more and more abstract representations, right? So, so some, some things might be just encoded more poorly and other things, you know, might be encoded, you know, more faithfully. Yeah. Uh, Um, well, I think, you know, the different, the different cortical areas are, you know, likely to be, you know, picking out features from the visual world um, that, you know, as I said, maybe more and more abstract. So, for example, you know, there, in the human, there's, it's known that there are, there's an area in the fusiform face area, which is actually highly sensitive to the identities of human faces. There are, there are areas which are sensitive to, you know, the encoding of specific objects, right? So, so, you know, all those areas are ultimately getting information from the retina. So at some level, the, the retina is providing everything that the cortex is making use of. But, you know, would you be able to identify, for example, the appearance of an object with a small number of neurons from the retina, as you might say from, you know, an object sensitive cortical area, or would you need larger numbers of neurons to pull it out, right? So, so at some level, I think as you, as you go up the hierarchy, right, you're seeing more efficient representations of more abstract things. Yeah. Uh, so the next question is uh, not so much physics space, but we talked about allowing the mice to be able to look something. How do you feel about like allowing them or like ex encouraging them versus preventing them from doing something? Is it going to take no management or is there like? Yeah. yeah, so there's, a, I mean, there's, 
they're sort of tricks of the trade, if you will, in terms of training mice to, to do things. And, and this has been developed over years of behavioral neuroscience. So um, it, you know, it starts uh, in stages. So, you know, first you might train the animal to, you know, to learn to, to lick for, for reward, right? Um, so they learn to associate the spout with, you know, the receipt of water and so forth. Um, and then you can begin to uh, associate the presentation of certain stimuli, you know, on the monitor with the availability of the, of the, of the drop on the spout and so forth. And then the hardest thing, which I think you alluded to, is to actually train them not to lick on the no-go trials. Um, and you can do that training with um, uh, things like giving them a timeout. So, so if they, they lick improperly, you can give them a timeout which they don't like because it means it will slow their ability to collect rewards. Or you can even give them a little air puff to sort of signal that, no, that wasn't right. Um, so they will, they will learn to withhold the licks on the no-go trials. Um, but it is one of the harder things they have to learn. Mice are quite compulsive, actually, even, even in comparison to rats. <laughs> well, in, yeah, flies. Flies are even harder to, to train sometimes. They, interestingly, they, they can be conditioned to do things. Um, so flies can do Pavlovian conditioning or classical conditioning. Um, so you can actually train flies to do things, um, but it, it really varies from species to species. Yeah. And the flies like different things too, of course. Maybe, uh... So uh, this is kind of my standard question that I always like to ask visitors, but how would you explain what you how would I explain it? Well, I would say that we're trying to understand how the, you know, the brain encodes the visual world. How does it make sense of what we see? Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you for your questions. Thank you.